Okay. Uh, today is August 8th, 2014, about 1.30 p.m., and uh, this will be the interview of John Francis Dowd of Watkinsville, Georgia. Is that correct? That is correct. Should I call you Professor Dowd? or? Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. When people call me Dr. Dowd, I look around for my father. <laughs> All right, well, we're here to talk a little bit about, uh, I want you to describe for us uh, your military service, specifically your service in Vietnam, particularly. Uh, welcome home and thank you for being here. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about where you grew up and how you ended up uh, in the Army, if you would. Right. Well, I was born in New Hampshire, and when, we were, when I was about 10 or so, we moved to Connecticut. As I said, my father was a, a college professor. He taught at what's now Southern Connecticut State University, before that, University of New Hampshire. And he had been an infantry officer in World War II, so I grew up sort of playing Army with all the accoutrements of, uh, of an infantry officer. And, uh, and when I was first, I went to uh, University of Maine as an undergraduate uh, in forestry. Actually, it was forest science. And I got a job with, through them uh, out in California for the Forest Service. For, I did that for two summers. And because I wanted to rock climb in Yosemite, I was, that was my hobby, was rock climbing. Right. And so uh, the fall of 67, my fall of my junior year, when I went back to school, I went, you know, I'm getting tired of this. I think I'm going to go back to Yosemite and just climb for a year, take a year off. Well, I made it to April. Actually, I didn't even make it to, to December before they called me in for a physical. Right. And then I got drafted in April of 68. And how old were you when you got drafted? I was uh, 19 uh, or 20, 19 or 20, someplace in there. The, uh, yeah, I, was, I was actually 19. I was 20 with the, the falling fall. Anyway, the, uh, then I uh, sort of early on, actually, I got, we got sent to, the, to Fort Dix. It was like on a Thursday. And the last thing my father said to me when he dropped me off at the reception center was, don't volunteer for anything. <laughs> yeah, good advice, which I tended to ignore. Anyway, the, uh, and so Friday you're in the reception center, Saturday you're in the reception center. I hadn't even made it to basic training yet. Sunday morning, I don't know, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, I and several other people were awakened in the barracks. And I spent 19 hours on KP mopping the kitchen floor not my idea of a good time. I had a ha half an hour for breakfast, a half an hour for lunch, a half an hour for dinner, and it was totally illegal, and I didn't know that. Anyway, so the next, very next day, we took uh, tests, you know, like eight hours worth of tests. And I should back up and say that my father was a, a psychology professor, and when I was a junior in high school, he finished his PhD in educational psychology, tests and measurements. And I spent an entire year taking every test known to man, because he, he would try them out on me first, I was the right age, and then he would give them to his large freshman class to get enough statistics to, you know, to do an analysis. So you were the guinea pig for the I test. was the guinea pig. My brother was too young and my sister was gone. She was in college. And, uh, and I didn't have any friends who would come over after a while because they'd have to take a <laughs> test too. It was really depressing. Anyway, so my one requirement, absolute requirement, was that when he graded the test, I wanted to watch to see what the answers were, all right? Anyway, so fast forward to that, that Monday. We're gonna take a test, and before then, I couldn't decide whether I would really do well and kind of thumb my no nose at the Army or just mark all Cs. <laughs> I couldn't decide, <laughs> and I, and I, I kind of agonized over it off and on for a couple hours, and I sat down at the first test, and I read the first question, and I started laughing. It was a question I'd seen before, and therefore I'd seen the answer before. And, uh, and that proceeded to be sort of a recurring theme all through the day. Right? And it was the only time I ever actually paid attention to taking the test because I was so mad. It may have been your father that devised the test. Who knows? Yeah, well, they were definitely questions he'd used, yeah. but he got them from all sorts of different locations. And uh, anyway, I don't know what it was, maybe 30% of all the, all the questions that day I'd seen before and remembered the answers. It wasn't even a question of whether I knew the answer or not. <laughs> anyway, so sometime later in the middle of basic training, the, uh, they call you in, you, know, you stand in line forever. Right, and you go see the spec four is going to tell you what you're going to do in the army. So I sit down, and there's this what looks like the Manhattan phone book on the desk, the only thing there. Right, and he goes, This is the field manual of all the schools in the United States Army. Pick one. 
And I looked at him and went, what? And he said, you had the highest score we've ever had at Fort Dix on those, wow. on those tests. He said, but don't pick automotive mechanics because you did worst on that. Which really ticked me off because I had an Austin Healey 3000 I totally rebuilt, right? <laughs> you know, so I thought I was actually a pretty good mechanic. And uh, anyway, so he said, I'm going to go take a smoke break. And he leaves. And, and I pick up this book, and it's like six-point type, you know, right? <laughs> thousands of schools, right? And I go, there's no way I can look at this thing. So I just put it back down. And my swimming coach from high school, who I'd helped out, I was a diver, and I'd helped out uh, at... Uh, meets just before I got I actually got drafted uh, he had told he had said to me look if you get an opportunity you should go to OCS become an officer and actually make this a positive experience and uh, and so when this kid came back I went all right I want to go to infantry OCS and this is in uh, and they've actually the allowed this you is to be a sum- college professor <laughs> after this I know <laughs> this is the summer of 1968 right, yeah, right. I got drafted just after the end of Tet you right. know what, what you saw every night on the TV was... No, I didn't Vietnam. see it on TV. I was there. Right, yeah. Then, well, you yeah. were there, sure. Right. But anyway, so uh, he goes, well, let me go check. Sometimes you had to have four years of college, sometimes two. And he goes, talks to some captain, comes back and said, all right, we'll put you in for it. He said, but you got three choices. So, you know, which, what schools, where you want to go? And, you know, infantry was first choice, but they would have given it to me anyway. So it didn't really matter what the other two were. Right. But to me, the Army was infantry. Anyway, so I go to... From AIT, I go to the <coughs> Benning School for Boys, Fort Benning, uh, the infantry school, and uh, 56 company, never forget it. And uh, towards the end of my 23-week experience there, the first 12 of which I spent running. <laughs> Delicately <laughs> put. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> and actually, the, uh, the 12th-week party, which was the first time we actually uh, got any time off. We had this big beer party. That was actually my 21st birthday. So I guess I was 20 when I got drafted. And uh, the day of my 21st birthday, and I always <coughs> thought it was nice of the Army to uh, to throw a, a beer bash for my 21st birthday. Right? <laughs> Who says the Army's bad? Anyway, all right. so towards the end of OCS, when we were senior candidates, uh, the first sergeant comes through the company and is looking for volunteers for ranger school. I had never heard of ranger school and nothing about it. And then one of my peers said, oh, they go rock climbing. And I went, okay, sign me up. <coughs> Which is how I ended up going to ranger school. That was a mistake. <laughs> that was, that was def- not only was it uh, the day I graduated and therefore became an officer, you know, I went to ranger school where you wear no rank. And there was something just wrong about yeah. that. But anyway, the, uh, and unfortunately, Eisenhower died when we were in the mountain phase, or just before the mountain phase, and so we had one day off. And so they took one of the two days of rock climbing out. But anyway, so it was not the most successful experience of my life. But um, so after, right, graduated from ranger school, went to jump school, which I always wanted to do. It was fun, right? And, uh, and I always had a deal with my mother. I would never tell her I was going to jump. I always told her I jumped, right, because she didn't like that too much. Anyway, then uh, went to the uh, 82nd Airborne as a platoon leader. But when I first got there, I don't know, I guess the company was someplace else. They didn't know what to do with me. So when did you actually graduate? So you went through ranger school, then then airborne school. Then airborne school. So that would be nine weeks ranger training, right. three yeah, that weeks was the airborne. Summer sixty nine. Summer sixty nine right. when you finally finished your airborne. Right, training. and okay. then and then uh, since they didn't have anything for me to do, I went to jump master school. Okay. You know when I first got there, right after jump school, which was kind of dumb, but actually it was a lot of fun. And just to explain briefly for those who don't yeah. know what a jump master jump is. Jump master is the guy who actually directs, gives the commands and directs when people jump from the aircraft and checks for safety and stuff. Okay. Right? We, had, we did another five or six jumps with you know, equipment and things. And then, uh, then I went to the 82nd. Yeah, Charlie Company, 1st of the 325 Infantry. And... Uh, that would have been again in the that was, summer of 69? That was summer of 69. Right? And then, uh, so we, you know, did normal platoon stuff. We, uh, the, I think the riots were in Detroit at, then that summer. But anyway, at one point we got, I remember sitting on the, uh, on the runway that, Air, that uh, Air Force Base is right next to Fort Bragg, and uh, on a duffel bag waiting to get deployed for anti-riot duty. And then they, then the, uh, they decided, Nixon decided not to, call up the 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 strack troops we didn't we practiced 
Right. So you would have right. been a second lieutenant. I was a second in, lieutenant at that uh, time. Platoon leader in Charlie yes. Company. Yes. All right. And uh, one of the, probably the most memorable thing I did while I was uh, uh, with the 82nd was uh, at one point uh, the, uh, the Army was testing all the new night vision, et cetera, equipment. And the CONUS test was assigned to the that being 82nd. That Continental U.S. Continental U.S. was assigned okay. to, yeah. Assigned to the 82nd, which was assigned to 325, which was assigned to, to uh, Charlie Company, which was assigned to my platoon. Right? And that was the bottom of the totem pole there. Anyway, so we went to the woods for two weeks and slept uh, out in the woods for two weeks. And it was, uh, it was called STANO, Surveillance, Target Acquisition, and Night Observation. And so it was all sorts of the, the next generation equipment, the next generation starlight scope, backpack, portable radar the first of the infrared scopes, uh, which was actually kind of cool, although way too big, and uh, et cetera, all sorts of stuff like it, active and passive infrared. And so every night after dark, we would run patrols with, with uh, some of the, whatever equipment we were testing that time, right, until I know two or three in the morning, and then sleep in putt tents, my platoon. And then uh, I had to make a report you know, on what worked, what didn't work. And, the, uh, and then because the, uh, the army is the army, they wouldn't let us sit around during the day, right? And so I had to, and, but there was really not much to do. So, so at one point, uh, because I was getting hassled, I got to do something with them. Uh, I made up a, a manual of arms with an M16 just for fun, right? So we practiced that. And then some general came to visit us. <laughs> <laughs> and my damn company commander said, well, show them your manual of arms. It was really, and they thought it was cool. But, uh, but they, anyway. Did the army adopt it? No. <laughs> but it kept me out of trouble, right? Okay. Right. And then in, uh, in the end of November, uh, I, I started what was called the MADOC course. It was a military advisory assistance course, basically, uh, for advisors. And... Uh, finished just before Christmas. So that it, it involved uh, how to interact with the Vietnamese, uh, you know, a, a lot about their culture, their history, uh, some Vietnamese language. So we, you know, we practiced that every day, which was kind of handy. And, uh, and then in January 1970, I went to Vietnam. And before I, I went, I stopped in, in California and I, I called up one of the one of the guys who I'd, I'd known from the Forest Service, who was a, also a summer employee, who was a, a music teacher in Sacramento, so I spent the weekend with him. Right? So, I, so I always said that I went from symphony to cacophony, but, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> all right, and then uh, we flew to, uh, we didn't start till late in the afternoon. We were sitting around the, wherever that air base was. In, in California? In California. Travis. Travis, yeah, Travis. Uh -huh. Waiting for a, a flight. You know, there's hundreds of people there. And there was this little gaggle of, uh, of second lieutenants sitting in one corner. We all, we all knew each other, right, or pretty much did. And then one of my friends said, all right, the hell with this. I'm going to, I'm going to the, the officer's club, which is way on the other side of the base, of course. And I said, well, what are you going to do if they call your name? And he said, what are they going to do, send me to Nam? <laughs> which is what we said all the time. Right? So he did. He disappeared and actually did miss his, his flight. He was extra two days there before he finally got out. didn't matter. No. Another ranger advisor. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so fly you knew up. you were going to military systems uh, my, command Vietnam. Yes, when you got and, your and orders. In fact, in fact, uh, my the the slot I was destined for was the one I ended up in, which was actually almost unique because you know you get in country and then then you go to wherever they actually needed somebody, uh -huh. right? But I ended up going to the slot I'd been programmed for by Department of the Army. But uh, anyway, so we flew from uh, from Travis to to Hawaii even, which is like two o'clock in the morning and therefore all the bars were closed, right? And then, uh, and then Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines where all the steward I got off. And then to Saigon and, and uh, a memorable moment was as we're approaching the coast of Vietnam, the, the pilot goes, if you look out the right, you can, you can see Vietnam. So the, the plane goes, <laughs> everybody in the plane goes, looks out the right, right? And we're flying over the, the jungles, you know, it's probably two core or something. And the, uh, and I could see a plane making passes. It looked like a matchstick type, you know, yeah. size. But you could see it glinting in the sun as he 
as he, probably an A1E, as he yeah. went in and came around each time. Dropping ordinance. Yeah, mm -hmm. or at least strafing. And um, Wake up call, wasn't it? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I went, hmm, this might be the real thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, so we landed Saigon. And, at uh, Tonsonut Airfield? Yeah, Tonsonut. Okay. And uh, go to, you know, put, we're putting these transient quarters. Right, before you get there, I want to ask you a couple of okay, questions sure. I ask everybody when I'm interviewing. Right. First of all, when you first stepped off the aircraft, mm -hmm. what was your first impression of Vietnam? If I, if I ask you right now, when that it door was, opened. It was really hot. Really hot. Now, you got to understand, what I didn't tell you was that, that uh, a week before, I was camping on the ice in upstate New York, ice climbing. So, uh, you know, where it was like 20 below or something. And so to step off in a high uh, humidity, high temperature place, it was debilitating. That was my, then that, my next impression when we got off the base was, uh, was the smell, All right? And nice. I will never forget that. I will tell you, I've interviewed numerous people. I did my own interview. And that is, those are the first two things everybody really? says. Really? Yeah. yeah. I, it's kind of a little experiment of mine, so please forgive me that. <laughs> yeah. So you were transported from Tonsonut. What right, was the first picked, base camp you were transported to? Uh, we were in at Tonsonut. At Tonsonut. Right? We were at Tonsonut at the MACV area at Tonsonut. The, um, and then we, for a, a couple of days, in fact, they said, you know, you can go to Cholon to the PX and all that sort of stuff. Right? And... Uh, so we sort of wandered around a little bit. I didn't wander around too much because I was trying to <laughs> acclimatize. And uh, got told not to come back at the uh, the really nice officers club because we were not high enough rank, even though it was illegal for them to do that. But what? Anyway, so then we went to uh, to Benoit. The, the people who hadn't, you know, as every day the, the cohort would get smaller, all second lieutenants. And then we went to Benoit and then uh, spent a night there. Uh, about half the people then got picked up by and, and sent to various American units, and then uh, went back to to Tonsonut. And there were only three or four of us. When we were first at Tonsonut, we'd been walking down the road, and it's because we knew what we were supposed to be doing. We were supposed to be ranger advisors, right? And this guy came by in a jeep, right, wearing a the ranger beret, right. So we kind of stopped him, started talking to him, and. Uh, and you know, we told him we were going to be ranger advisors too. Oh, anyway, so I go back, and this, the person who comes to pick me up is Don Valentine, the guy who we had stopped like three or four days earlier. Oh, right. And so I actually, was, he was the senior advisor for the 52nd Vietnamese Ranger Battalion, and uh, and I became the assistant senior advisor. And so he took me back to the the base camp in Hoc Man, and uh, we. Uh, you know, we so transported by jeep. Yeah, we, we we yeah. had we had two jeeps, with the same bumper number. They were both stolen, and no. <laughs> yeah, they were phony bumper. No, numbers. they were combat lost. You yeah, were, right, yeah. of course. And uh, and we had two drivers slash cooks who were Vietnamese Rangers. One was uh, Hashinut Corporal Long, who had who was in his probably his mid forties at that point. Uh, he'd been a Viet Minh uh, before the American involvement. Didn't like the French, hated the French, but didn't like the communists either. And uh, and he, they always were, wanted to promote him to to sergeant. But if he became a sergeant, he could no longer uh, be the the cook slash driver with the with the advisors, and it was a great job, right? And then the other was a young kid. He was maybe 19 or 20, and he got the job by uh, before I was there by uh, single handedly taking out a, a machine gun nest, charging it and taking it out. How many? Um... Vietnamese troops were there in the 52nd Ranger? Well, it was supposed to be 500, but it was often more like 300, 350. And uh, it was, they were always under strength, right? And so we had uh, two officers and two NCOs. That was the, the advisory team. And the junior NCO, I, never, I can never remember his name because we had like three or four that kept swapping out. But the, uh, but the senior NCO had been there almost two years, Sergeant Joukowsky. And, uh, and Don Valentine had been in country for a year, almost a year when I got there. And then he left after I'd been there about three months and uh, took a leave in the States and then came back. He was extended for six months. I would have too if I'd lasted long enough. And, uh, but we got a, after a while, after three weeks or so, we got a, a captain who was a West Pointer that 
I don't remember his name. I don't remember much about him <laughs> other than that he never seemed to go to the field. Yeah. <laughs> they were protecting him, right? That's right. Yeah. But anyway, we, uh, it was, uh, we were three Corps Ready Reserve, basically, the, the Vietnamese Rangers. Uh, we were in the rocket belt uh, on the northwest side of, of Saigon. That was, so we ran patrols all the time. Now there was a point at which they referred to that area that yeah. you're referring that you're talking about, mm -hmm. the 25th Division AO, which is sounds right. like where you were, and the 1st Infantry Division AO right. to the east on the other side of the river, and they referred to that as the Umbrella Defense. Did they call it that? I when never you were heard there? that. No. Okay. The, they called it the Rocket. The belt Rocket Belt. It was where, where they fired uh, rockets into Tonsonut, et cetera. Yeah. They had base plates hidden around and stuff. Yeah. And it was right on the edge of the the eastern edge of the Plain of Reeds. And were all 300 to 350 Rangers in the same base camp you were in? Yes, more or less. Okay. And they, they, but we had some, there were some rough uh, regional force, popular force, rough, rough puffs, puffs <laughs> uh, units around. But, uh, but yeah, mostly they were there. And then we would run operations, either uh, typically company size operations, but occasionally uh, battalion size operations, sometimes even larger. Okay. Uh, third Ranger group size operations. And what was your primary mission at right. the 52nd? My job was, uh, well, the, the advisor's job in the 52nd was to act as liaison between the Vietnamese and Amer any American support, any American unit. Okay. Americans well, American, would not talk to the Vietnamese. What American units were you uh, well, it, working it, with? Well it, well, it was whoever was supplying support. Artillery, uh, any uh, aircraft, including uh, medevac, uh, and we would get uh, choppers and, and gunships and, and actually run operations. Mm -hmm. uh, any sort of material support we could scrounge for them, you know, lumber, cement, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, essentially, anything that, that, that was an American unit, the Americans would not talk to the Vietnamese. They'd only talk to the, to the uh, American advisor, who would then talk to, the, to their Vietnamese counterpart. Okay. And, um, you know, you and I and all of us that were there understand the term counterpart, but mm -hmm. counterpart is the Vietnamese officer who was your direct Right, or, or, or senior NCO, whoever was, was the senior person with the unit that you were advising at the time. I mean, I, it ranged from the battalion commander, although normally the senior advisor dealt with the battalion commander, uh, and then if there were a company or two companies that were split from them, then I would go with them, and one of the NCOs would go with me, usually the senior NCO to keep me out of trouble. And then the junior NCO would go with the, uh, the senior advisor whenever we split. Uh, sometimes it was strictly a company size operation. The smallest I ever went on was, uh, was a, a small squad. And that was a night ambush patrol where I'd given them a, I, we were, I was called in to Saigon and given a class on mechanical ambushes, which is a mechanical way of detonating a Claymore mine, right? Basically hot wiring it, right? And, uh, and then I went, back to the unit and I gave a class to the Vietnamese on how to do this and, you know, blew up just the blasting cap, et cetera, just to, okay. under a... To give them a demo. To give them a demo, right? Okay. And then uh, I was told I had to go to the field with them the first time, right? And so I, I actually set it up. It was on the Hoc Man Canal where they, one of the places where, where the Viet Cong would cross with the NVA. And uh, so we put a trip wire across that spot and... Uh, they were told to bring extra wire, which they, of course, did not bring. So I only had the 100 feet of wire, which was way too short, to go to the, the trip wire, come back in the, in the Claymore. So when I, when I actually attached the radio battery, right, I was kind of like this, because I was, I was only like 20 feet in back of the thing, lying on the ground, wondering if I uh, had a short in there someplace. As long as you have it facing the right way, you're Yeah, it was okay. facing the right yeah. way. But, you know, there's still a back blast to those things. Anyway, so we set it up, and then we sat there all night, and nobody tripped it. So you didn't pop the ambush or? No, nah, yeah. it was unfortunate. But the, uh, but middle of the, it was like 11 o'clock at night, uh, this helicopter came flying down the Hakman Canal firing machine gun, right? And we're sitting, you know, 40 or 50 feet from the edge of the Hakman Canal. The other side of the Hakman Canal is free fire zone, right? And so I get on the radio immediately and call it check fire. Like, I don't know who's doing this. Uh, I found out later it was one of the, captains from the, for actually the ranger group, our ranger group, the next higher unit, right? And I yelled at him about that. He stopped firing them when they, when I told him to. <laughs> 
But uh, yeah. I yelled at him about that, you know, several days later when I found out who it was. I said, you didn't know where you were. He said, yeah, I knew exactly where you were. I looked at him like, I didn't know where I was. How do yeah. you think you know where I was? Well, I don't know about your experience in combat, but mine were frequently people got disoriented as to where they were versus where they were supposed to be. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. In, fa in fact, uh, I'll jump ahead for just a second to Please. Cambodia. When we were in Cambodia, we were... It was this is the second time it happened. The uh, we it was a combined arms operation. So the Vietnamese Rangers supplied the infantry, and then there was an uh, an armored cavalry unit, Vietnamese, right? And uh, I I would ride on the command track with the with the CAV commander, and uh, we'd have the Vietnamese Ford Observer, and we'd be sitting on the back together, feet dangling off the back of the armored personnel carrier, right? And I keep track on the map where I was. Right, because it kind of seemed like a good thing to do, but it was flat as a pancake. It was actually hard to navigate because you didn't know exactly where you were, and there were no. You could see Nui Ba Den, the Black Virgin Mountain, way off in the distance, mm -hmm. right? And you could see what was called the Straight Edge Woods, which was marked the edge of Cambodia and Vietnam, and then there was just clumps of of vegetation around little hamlets, that in this dead flat area, and that was all sort of dead grass. And uh, at one point early on. Uh, the uh, the sergeant, my sergeant asked me where we were, and I said we're here. And the and the Vietnamese Ford observer said, no, 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 we're over here. I, no, we're not. We're right here. I said five minutes. We're going to cross this road. Right, five minutes exactly. It was pure luck. We crossed the road. <laughs> After that, he never questioned, <laughs> right, whether I knew where we were. But uh, what I would do is I would put my finger on the map periodically where we were, and uh, and I would kind of look out of the corner of my eye to see where he was marking it. And uh, if he was in the wrong spot, I'd put my finger on the, where we were, and then he'd kind of look over and he'd move his finger to where we were. Because mm -hmm. I did not want him calling artillery in on us. So mistake. you were not one of those uh, dangerous second lieutenants with a map? I was a fourth year <coughs> student. I mean, I, <laughs> I, learned, okay. I, learned, I, learned, I learned, I actually learned map reading from my father when I was like 10 years old or something. But no. So what was the... the Fifty Second Ranger. What was their overall mission? And then I want you to get back to the right. incursion into sure. Cambodia. I right. definitely don't. All right. Well, miss that. before that, all right. So their their mission was, as I say, three corps ready reserve. They went to wherever there was a problem in three corps, right? But uh, when I was first there, uh, they had one company for a, a long time that was down southeast of Saigon. We were northwest of Saigon. They had one company southeast of Saigon with <clears> a, <throat> a uh, sort of op conduit in the Delta. It was actually on the edge of, uh, as I look at it now, the the Lang, uh, the uh, what is it, Rangsat Special Zone. The Rangsat Special Zone. Yeah, right. Zone. The yeah. Forest of the Assassins. Uh -huh. Right. It was it was on the edge of that, and, and we ran operations in there basically. Uh, one week, normally the we sent one of the NCO, one of the two NCOs down, but when we didn't have the second NCO, I ended up going down there for a week. Uh, and it was the end of the month. It was the beginning of the next month. So I, I took the new call sign and, and freaks for the, for the eva you know the other unit, right? And it, uh, so the I'd been there like a day, two days. Turned the the radio to the, uh, to the new frequency for the other ranger unit, right? And all I get is Vietnamese television, right? <laughs> and uh, you know you can't talk over it, right? <laughs> and, and so I, I go, oh, I must have written them down wrong. So I call. So I, so I call back to my to uh, to my guys and go, uh, can you send me that frequency again? <laughs> you know, it was like your age plus something or other. Yeah. Right? No, that's what I got. Well, I'm not going to communicate on this. Right? Anyway, then I get a word a little later to uh, drive over to this to the headquarters there, and talk to the the major who was the battalion, who was the the senior advisor for that battalion over there. And he locked my heels and yelled at me for like ten minutes. Right? You idiot! You can't even you can't even <laughs> You know, do frequency correctly. Yeah. <laughs> right? And I said, sir, it's Vietnamese television. Yeah, no, 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 no. Sends me back. Right? A uh, few hours later, maybe the next day, quietly I get this new frequency for them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I was sitting right on the harmonic. You know, I was just in the spot where the harmonic was strong. And, yeah. And, and they probably didn't hear it so, so much where he was. But anyway. Uh, so I spent a week there. Ran one operation uh, where we got... Uh, Heli a light ship helicopter command and command and control chopper and two gunships. Were you doing search and destroy missions? Is that what you were working well, on? Well, we did sometimes, but this, this particular one uh, was, we'd, they'd fly around and they'd light up an area 
right? And if they saw anything moving, they'd shoot it. And uh, we had some ambush patrols out. So I had a second lieutenant, the ranger, company commander, basically, uh, who was going to tell me whether or not they were friendlies, except he was so drunk that he spent most of his time sort of hanging out the helicopter. <laughs> he was not my favorite guy. But uh, anyway, that was... But we, uh, we often ran... We often ran... Uh, operations, we, several times we ran operations that were basically, uh, they were called eagle flights, mm -hmm. right? We'd get a, a command and control chopper and five slicks and two gunships. Okay, just for those of you who don't know what a slick is, uh, a slick yeah, is a troop transport helicopter, right. a Huey model, yes. usually a B. Right. Um, and what else did you have besides the we five had two, slicks? We had two gunships, but they were, they were uh, the Huey. The Huey gunships. gunships. With the not rockets the, the, or, or the with the... These had machine guns. Okay. Right. Uh, and how often would you say in a given uh, month, how often would you say you were out on patrols where you contacted uh, we, the enemy? Well, I don't, we didn't contact the enemy all that much. They kind of tried to avoid us, but the, uh, but we'd run an operation every, about every third day, okay. something like that, some sort of operation. And, and we had ambush patrols out all the time, but, but we didn't always have advisors. And you would move with the unit when they were running these, whether it be an yeah. ambush or well, an actual well, ground exa operation. an example, you asked me earlier what, what, what our job was. Yeah. Right, I'll, this is the classic example of my job, right? So we've, we're flying, we get these slicks, right? Load them up with a, a platoon of Vietnamese Rangers, right? I had the Vietnamese S, uh, uh, S5, S3 with me, the operations officer, right? And we, we fly along. And I had the, the map that was marked with all the objectives, where we were supposed to put everybody down, as did he, right? But he was actually supposed to mark, tell me where, and then I would tell the pilot. So I, had, I could talk to the, to the, the uh, Vietnamese officer, who was a captain, and then I could talk on the intercom to the, the pilot, who would then mark the, the spot for the, for the first slick with a, a smoke. And, uh, and then I could also switch uh, to the... Uh, the command frequency, our command frequency, so I could talk to my sergeant when he was on the ground. And they'd, they'd go out and do a, a quick patrol, right, looking for anybody, come back, we'd pick them up, we'd move them to another spot, and we just sort of, it was no orderly manner to okay. it. They were hopscotch all over the countryside. All right, so was that only in the room set special? No, zone, this, was this, was, this was in the, probably the edge of the Plain of Reeds. This was northwest of Saigon, not in rung set. Okay, the, so um, pretty much in the 25th Division's AO. Right. Yeah. Or it was actually the RAO, but yeah. your RAO, but yeah, you <laughs> right. shared it with the 25th right. Infantry. Division. But uh, but it was but that was classic example. But the uh, but the uh, S3 didn't like flying, so he, after a while, he just got airsick, and uh, <laughs> and so and so I stopped asking him. I did the same thing he had, so I just started running it, which okay. I was not supposed to do. Then we went back for lunch, and the uh, the command pilot said to me, I had 42 blade hours to work with, and he said to me. Uh, all right, we're going to sit down for an hour. He said, if I keep the blades turning, we can leave immediately if your guys have a problem. Otherwise, uh, you know, we'll have to wait 20 minutes before we can start the engines up again. And I'm thinking to myself, that doesn't sound right, A. And B, because he just wanted to burn like seven blade hours doing nothing, right? And B, I got, I got a whole company here of, uh, of Vietnamese Rangers with uh, M16s. If I tell you to turn the engine on, you're turning that engine on. Right. I can tell you from all those years yeah. I flew right. uh, in the back when we were when I was running the Bloodhounds and the other type yeah. missions, they can crank that thing up and oh, be yeah. off the be off the ground in, in forty five to seconds to oh, a minute. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He was lying. I yeah. was I was virtually yeah. positive he was lying, but but I figured that 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 I would call his bluff anyway if I had to. Yeah. Right. But but I didn't. He was disappointed when I told him to shut the engines down. So I noticed that uh, you do have a Purple Heart. I know you yes. have the Combat Infantryman's yeah, Badge, and right. thank you for that. I'm, a, mm -hmm. I'm an infantryman myself, yep. and it's the badge of honor. Right. Um, tell actually, us about, I actually wore my father's from World War II. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. Uh, tell us about, I noticed you have a Purple Heart. Tell right. us about uh, how you got wounded. Tell us about All right. that. Kind well, of before, before I get to Cambodia, I should, I uh -huh. should mention we, went, we ran a couple other operations. One was uh, uh, over southwest of Saigon in... Uh, in what was called the Pineapple Plantation. It was a heavily booby-trapped area. We ran a two-day operation there. And I spent my time making sure I walked where they walked in front of me. You know, middle of the first afternoon, the first day, this explosion went off in back of me. When one of the rangers tripped something. Not my idea of a place you wanted to work. No. Right? And then uh, we left. Hakban went over to Honai and then went up into the Central Highlands 
But this was after, well, first we went to Cambodia in early April 1970. And all of the advisors had to stay on the Vietnamese side of the border, right, in the Angel's Wing, where the, the, the highway, main highway from Saigon to Phnom Penh crosses. And uh, the village there, I don't know what the Vietnamese name was, but it was, but it was known amongst the, re the advisors as Diamond Village. Anyway, so we sat there for several days while they ran the operation across the border. And no, you as an advisor did not cross. We were not allowed. There were no advisors across the border with the Vietnamese Rangers. It was actually a combined operation. They had, they had the, the same armored cavalry in it. Did they have, was this a mechanized assault or was it? It was, a con, it was, a, it was combined arms. So okay. they had armored personnel carriers, uh, tanks, the, the CAV unit did, and then the Vietnamese Rangers were the, were the infantry support to that. Was it a Vietnamese CAV unit? Strictly or Vietnamese. Strictly Vietnamese. Yeah, it was, I think it was a 5th Armored Cavalry Regiment or something like that. Okay. And uh, we'd worked with them earlier, too, in, uh, during Tet of 1970. They, we'd done an operation. And uh, anyway, so we sit on the border. Actually, we arrived at the border uh, just at the end of uh, a firefight between about 200 Viet North Vietnamese and uh, the Rough Puff unit right on the border. And uh, imagine their shock as the, as the unit comes across the border, doesn't stop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, they captured all sorts of stuff. And uh, anyway, we go back to Honai and, uh, and, go, and then get sent up to the, the start of the Central Highlands. We went uh, along the coast, uh, or towards the coast on the main road towards uh, Fantiat, about halfway there. I can't remember the name of the town. There's a road, main road that goes north. Went north and then all the way up into the Central Highlands, and at one point, towards the end of the day, and just before we got to where we were going, we entered this long, narrow valley that uh, had been Rome plowed about a hundred meters on either side. Uh, a Rome plow is a bulldozer, a with, bulldozer with, a, with, a huge, with a hook on the end of it. Well, it was a huge blade. Yeah, uh, that was actually made in Rome, Georgia. Yeah. That's why yeah, it was I always wondered why they called them Rome plow. That's why they called it Rome plow. Okay, right and. Uh, and anyway, they, they would just knock down all the vegetation, right? And then above that for, I don't know, maybe a thousand feet or so, the steep slope is heavily vegetated. You couldn't see anything, right? And for a long distance, a quarter of a mile, something like that, there were American uh, trucks and you know, vehicles all burned out on either side of the road, obviously pushed off the road. It was a huge ambush from sometime earlier that year. It was very spooky, right? Uh, Anyway, so we make it and get up to the top of this ridge, and uh, it's a mountain yard village, and we're supposed to be there for like a month or three weeks or something. And one of the things we were looking for was uh, an Ameri where there was su supposedly American POWs held prisoner in that area, and so that was one of the things we were looking for. And the uh, at one point, uh, the first day I just, I volunteered to go with them on a, a sweep around the area because I just wanted to see the countryside, right? And uh, it, was a little, it was very different from, from down near Saigon where it was nice and flat. This was quite mountainous and uh, with uh, basically a hardwood forest with lots of wait-a-minute vines and things like that. And about halfway through that, that sweep, we were, sitting, we were taking a break and this Vietnamese soldier came up to me and showed me a picture that he had uh, picked up in Cambodia that, you know, the week earlier of an American POW. Right, so I got him to give me the picture, and then I sent it back through channels. And uh, never heard anything more about it, but I always wondered what happened. But the, uh, we, were, we ran one operation where we uh, called in artillery, and you know, then it was the artillery, we land all these people. And uh, much to my dismay, I, I was forced to, to run it from the command and control chopper rather than get go on the ground, which is really where I wanted to be. It ticked me off. But anyway. Uh, it, and then all of a sudden they told us, all right, we're going back to Honai. So we go back to Honai, and, uh, and then about two days later, uh, we found out we're going back to Cambodia, except that uh, they, were, they were letting the advisors go across the border, but no American units at that point. And so they sent me uh, to... When a, was this? This was uh, essentially May 1st, 1970. It was, a, it, was, it was like the last two days of April, I think. Uh, I, so I, they sent me to uh, a battalion headquarters that was out in the woods on the, on the Cambodian border. It was 25th Infantry Division unit. I don't remember which battalion it was. 
And so I was liaison between the, the Vietnamese across the border and American support uh, on the Vietnamese side of the border. I spent like two days there with them. And I, you know, I had to go brief the, the uh, Vietnamese, uh, the American commander you know, at like five o'clock or something. They didn't like me. I didn't like them. So it was, <laughs> I, anyway. Mutual, I didn't, well, they, mutual admiration. Yeah, right. Their, yeah, they, yeah. you know, because we, but one of the things was we wore camouflage jungle fatigues. Virtually nobody wore camouflage jungle fatigues. No. We had, we, I had both tiger, a tiger, two tiger uniforms, the, what the Vietnamese wore, but they were really hot. But I had uh, several sets of, of regular jungle fatigues that were camo. Uh, that's what we always wore. And I never wore anything but camo jungle fatigues. There. And uh, so we kind of stood out when you were, you know, when you go visit an American unit, mm -hmm. right? And they pretty much ignored me most of the time. And I just monitored the net, my people, and if they needed artillery or something, you know, I'd talk to the, the, the Americans. Anyway, then they, they got the word that they were cro crossing the border as well. So I got a... They being the 25th. The, the 25th, that unit, right? So I didn't need to be there anymore. So I got a ride to a base camp on a chopper, spent the night there. It was, this was, it was really weird. Do you know what base camp I have you no were? idea where I was. I yeah. don't know who it was. All I know is they were, I, they, they gave me a, because uh, this happened late in the afternoon, right? And they gave, they gave me a, a cot to sleep on. It was just below the artillery was firing. I think it was 155s that were firing all night too, because, I mean, it almost knocked me off the cot every time they fire, right? But, uh, but anyway, but I went to sleep. No earplugs in, I bet. No. Yeah. Right? And then the next morning I get mm -hmm. this, I get another ride. And it was one of these two rides. When I got on the chopper, I didn't like, you know, I usually didn't put my seatbelt on until we were appreciably in the air because if they had a problem taking off, I didn't want to be in that thing, right? Anyway, I got yelled at by some general or colonel or somebody who put you fast in your seatbelt. Right. Anyway, so the second uh, flight was to uh, Duke Way Special Forces Camp, which was right on the border uh, of the Parrot's Beak, just south of the Angel's Wing. Right. So they dropped me off there, and I spend the night there. And those guys ignored me, too. Right. Was Every, this at Budop? Did Duke, Duke Way. Oh, Duke Way. Duke okay, Way. Okay, gotcha. Right. And uh, in the swamps, in the, you know, the, this is the western edge of the Plain of Reeds, mm. right? In the, and uh, it was all wetlands all around. It was really kind of cool. And it was, it was very uh, striking. It was a, 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 like a Pentagon, star-shaped compound. And uh, anyway, so the next morning, they're supposed to pick me up. My guys are supposed to pick me up. I actually send a chopper over to pick me up. So I go outside the wire, and I'm sitting there on my on my pack, you know, and outside the wire. And then these guys start walking out of the swamps. <laughs> <laughs> it was a it was a you know a special forces patrol, you know, but yeah, but uh, it was kind of spooky. Anyway, yeah. then they pick me up and fly me back to the to my guys, in uh, in Cambodia. So when were you wounded? All right. So I was there for several weeks before I was wounded. Okay. I was wounded. Uh, on the 17th, 19th of May, someplace in there. And where were you hit? Where where were you wounded? Not the p location of Vietnam, yeah, the no. location on your body. Right here, back of my arm. Oh, okay. Right. What happened was, I, uh, so we first, when I get there, uh, mo for the most part, because the, the captain who was the senior advisor, they were sort of protecting, right? When they sent, when, when the 52nd was, going out with these guys usually i went with them right so i spent a lot of time in the field right and then after several weeks they had basically a, a several days while well, we were first there i mean, i'd been there maybe two days and, and we had a one day stand down right the whole war stopped right and the word was that that somebody had been an advisor had been injured by friendly fires or something like that right and so we were told that a uh, that a general was going to come give us a class on how to dig a foxhole and how to call in artillery, right, which we thought was kind of funny, right? So we're sitting around all day just. I share, the, I share your sense of humor. <laughs> we're sitting yeah. around and sort of enjoying ourselves, and um, and a friend of mine comes by in a jeep, another ranger advisor, Joe Hunt, and uh, and he has a, a copy of Pacific Stars and Stripes and the the iconic picture of uh, Kent State is on the on the cover right and I remember th thinking well of course they had ammo you know, <laughs> you know what would you expect from what's the point yeah if they didn't have ammo yeah. right but uh, but anyway so that's when I found out about 
who was protesting us. Yeah. But, uh, but anyway, so uh, we never did see the generals, so we never got our class. It was oh. so disappointing. But, the, uh, but we do uh, go on, continue to do these various operations, and about every other day we had a contact. Some of them, we, at one point, we killed the uh, uh, North Vietnamese colonel and his entire staff, kind of stumbled in on us. Okay, what about your exposure, if any, to Agent Orange? Uh, that was, uh, I was definitely exposed to Agent Orange. I knew what it was from forestry school, right? And uh, early on, I remember walking through this area uh, that all the plants were wilting and, and saying to, asking Ski, do you know what's wrong with these plants? And he goes, no. And I said, ah, they just sprayed them with Agent Orange. <laughs> you knew it was Agent Orange. Oh, I knew it was Agent Orange. I knew exactly what it was. I knew that it was a combination of 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T. See, we didn't. We yeah. knew it was a defoliant, but that's yeah. all we knew. Well, you know, I wouldn't have known from the Army. I knew it from, from forestry school. Yeah. But we had a class on pesticides, right? So, Have you had any residual effects from the Agent Orange exposure? Not that I know of. Yeah. But, uh, but the worst part of it was, of course, that you, you know, you'd move the vegetation around and stuff, and it'd get all over your hands, and then there was no way to wash your hands before you ate. Right, so uh, who knows how much. Okay. So was your entire, you, you had a 12-month tour in Vietnam? Well, it was supposed to be 12 months. I was only there about five before I oh, got you, wounded. Oh, you, so when you got wounded, they shipped you home? At, well, it's, Through Japan? Uh, yeah, long, it took a long time. Tell me about that. All right, well, well, first of all, I'll tell you how we got wounded. All right, so they, uh, at one point they stopped and they said, all right, you guys are going to hold, hold in, in, in where you are. We weren't that far from Sve Riang, the Cambodian city, and uh, and then they we had a two day patrol in the in the our rear area that they sent me on, and uh, which I was a little disappointed because Joukowsky had been sent back to to Saigon, right? And we were starving. I was eating Vietnamese rations. And the Vietnamese ration was a bag about yay big of cooked rice and a, a sea ration can of chicken or tuna. And that was it. That was your that was your ration for the day, right? And so you'd get it in the morning. You'd pour it. You'd open the the chicken or tuna, pour it in with the the rice, mix it up a little bit, uh, stick it on next to the exhaust of one of the APCs, right? Let it heat up a little bit to make I it more it, palatable. I take it you didn't have sterno. No, we didn't <laughs> okay. have anything, right? Okay. Eat a little bit of it, yeah. you know. Put it in your pack. Lunchtime, eat a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Dinner time, finish it off. And about every third day, if you were lucky, you'd get a, a small can of fruit or something too. Right. And no so, C4 to heat your food with? No, we had C4. The only time I, I never saw The only time I saw C4 was when I was giving that class. Like, <laughs> we had one thermite grenade for our, uh, for our oh. commo gear, and that was it. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so, so I'm with this unit for two days, and, I, and they had promised me they were going to send me back to Saigon so I could get some food. Because uh, it was a little debilitating. But they, uh, but they didn't. They lied. All right, so the second day... Right, we're driving along, and, and we stopped at this. You know, we had like six or eight objectives, and we stopped at this bunker area, and there were all sorts of bunkers there. And we had lunch, it was a Sunday, and uh, and then right after, you know, early, you know, like one o'clock or something, we move out again, and I'm riding, because I'm the senior American. There was there was me, and then there was a staff sergeant who was the CAV advisor. Were right. you a first lieutenant? I was a first point? lieutenant. Yes. Okay. All right. So I'm sitting on the jeep seat that's wired to the right hand side top of this of the command track. And there are like 17 antennas, right? And I have headphones on, uh, and a ANGRC 47, a truck mounted radio, that I can talk on with pork chop yeah, microphone, and uh, and my M16 is sort of slid underneath me, and so I'm uh, riding along, and it was hot, and I was tired. And so I do what I always do when it's hot, when I'm hot and tired. I was napping, right? And so I, I have my, I looked at the map, and I looked way ahead, and like, yeah, you know, probably 800 meters, a thousand meters in front, I could see this little brushy area. And I looked at that and went, hmm, that's a thousand meters east of our next objective, which is like our second to last. All right, no problem. Put the put the map away. Fell asleep, you know, sort of dozing, checking my eyelids for pinholes and things, <laughs> right? And the next thing I know, I'm rudely awakened by the sound of bullets bouncing off the side of the armored personnel carrier or going past me. And I look up and there's this gun smoke, right? From this brushy area that's only like, I don't know, 100 feet away, 75 feet away. I mean, we were right on top of it, right? And, uh, and so I did what everybody else did. I jumped down inside, right? And we had a, 
this was one of the APCs that had a, a cupola on the front with twin 30s, right? And so he starts firing. We start backing up. And, uh, and the next thing I, and then, so I stand up and I'm going to grab my M16 and shoot, right? And they opened up from a couple spider holes on either side. So they hit us in a crossfire. So I decided that was a bad idea. So you drove right into an ambush. Yeah, oh yeah. And they waited yeah. for the command track. Because we had like 17 personnel carriers and two tanks. That's why I hated those damn antennas. Yeah. Oh, no. It was, yeah. And, and, and the, the CAV commander, who was a captain, he's sitting on the jeep seat on the, on the left-hand side. I'm sitting in the jeep seat on the right-hand side, a foot and a half taller than him, so it's not too obvious who yeah. I am. Uh -huh. Right? And, you know, it's obvious that's who you're going to shoot at. Right? Yeah. Anyway, so we start backing up, and the next thing I know, there's this huge explosion. They dropped a mortar round on top of us. Unbelievable shot. Uh -huh. It landed... That far from my head. On You're the, inside the piece. I was inside. I was talking on the radio. I called Jukowski. He was at the higher headquarters. I called him and told him we were in contact, and I'd let him know if we needed artillery or, or uh, gunships or something. And uh, and I remember it, and I was sort of scooched down, and I'm thinking to myself, eh, time to stand up. Mm -hmm. I hated standing up in firefights, but the, when the Vietnamese commander did, I had to, right? And uh, and so I'm thinking. All right, I got to stand up. Can I think of any other excuse to talk on the radio? No, and that's when the the mortar round hit, and the CAF commander and the and the Vietnamese Ford observer had just stood up, and they were both killed, mm -hmm. and I would have been if I'd stood up, right? And um, it was that close. Anyway, but and it was like that far from coming down inside on top of my head. Uh -huh. Anyway, but uh, so the shrapnel all came down inside and got everybody, and got me in the back of the arm, and uh, so. Instantly, I couldn't use my right arm at all. I couldn't feel my fingers. I couldn't move my. You're right-handed. I'm right-handed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I called uh, Jakowski back and I said, "We need American medevac." And the the rule was for advisors, if uh, if the Vietnamese were wounded, they they called. They always called. They were supposed to call for a Vietnamese medevac first, which would never show up. Yeah. And then they'd call for American medevac. But if it was American were wounded, you had to. They couldn't ride on a Vietnamese. Yeah, they medevac. called. It had, to be, right away. had to be had to be American medevac. Uh -huh. Right, and so I called Jakowski and said, "We need an uh, American medevac." And he goes, "Do you have American wounded?" And I go, "Yes." And he goes, "How many?" And I go, two. And uh, and there's, there's this pregnant pause, and he and he goes, as he's counting, and there's yeah. only two of us out there. <laughs> he goes, "Are you wounded?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he woke up from the <laughs> fog. Huh? Yeah, right. Yeah. Anyway, so we back up out of the kill zone, and uh, and they opened the back. And I sort of crawled out, and I remember trying to reach up to. I thrown the the headphones over the side. Do you have a medic with you? There were yeah, Vietnamese medic. Yeah, yeah, there were a couple of them. And I, so I throw the headphones over the side, and I walk around to the side to put the headphones on. And I, and I forgot that my arm wasn't working. And I try to lift my arm, and uh, and the next thing I know, I'm lying on my back looking up at it, right? And then um, that's when a Vietnamese medic came by, and he he bandaged my arm, stopped the bleeding, and gave me a shot of something and t put a tag on me. And, uh, and then I told the, the Vietnamese, uh, you know, I told them to get the other, the other advisor. Actually, in Vietnamese, that was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. You know, and then eventually the, the command and control chopper for our headquarters showed up, and they, they carried everybody back to the, to the rear area in Cambodia. And, uh, and then we sat around. I lay on a, on a bunk for a, for a while, for several hours probably, uh, in this Army tent with those they had sides. They had a tourniquet, or they just had it bandaged. Yeah, it was. It, it wasn't. It was just. Uh, actually, it wasn't an arterial arterial bleeding, so it was okay. Yeah, but uh, the uh, okay to them, not yeah, okay, okay to, to them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't okay to me. Right, and I remember lying there. I'm lying by myself because yeah. I don't know where the that sergeant was. I don't know the Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. Where I was with the 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 uh, the uh, ranger advisors, right? And I and I vividly remember at one point this. Uh, American walking out of the next tent, and it was close enough. I don't know who he was. I'd never seen him before, but he was close enough so I could read his rank. He was a major, mm -hmm. and uh, artillery. So I, I figured it was the the artillery talk, tactical operations center. Yeah. And uh, anyway, and I remember, uh, I'm lying there, and I'm just covered in blood, mostly other people's, but some of it mine. And uh, I remember thinking, that is the most grave look on somebody's face I've ever seen. And then kind of dawned me, oh, wait a minute, he's looking at... Major's face? Yeah, on this yeah. Major's face. And I went, wait a minute, he's looking at me. <laughs> this isn't good. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so then 
that finally a medevac chopper shows up. Uh -huh. They load the the an American American yes the dust so it was a dust yeah chopper. it was yeah Red Cross and yeah. everything right no doors right so they load us the the other American and me on the left hand side in the door gunner seats right because we're ambulatory all right so they didn't have you in a litter I did not I was not in okay. a litter although I'd already passed out once yeah right and they I shoot can't, you up with morphine I, I don't know what he gave me. Okay. I couldn't read the tag. It was in Vietnamese. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but uh, so they, they load the, the, the Vietnamese up in the litter, right? Mm -hmm. Inside, right? They sit me down on the, on the left hand side, the, the left person, right? And the other American sitting, the sergeant sitting on my right. And there's the, the pole for uh -huh. the door gunner, right? So he's holding it like this because he got hit here and here and he couldn't move his right hand either, right? So he's holding oh, like he has this. He to reach over. Or he's reach holding over like, like this, this, right? Yeah. I'm sitting in the, like this. Right with the edge of the, the right hand side, right here. So here's the front of the aircraft. My feet are sort of even mm -hmm. with the aircraft, right? And I don't know if you've ever tried, but it is impossible to fasten a military seatbelt one-handed. Yeah, you, you can't can. do it. You cannot. Right. Somebody else would have to hold the buckle. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah, it just you just cannot do it, right? I try and I can't do it, and we take off. Nobody come around to see us, right? And we take off, and so we're and I I reach over and grab him because there's nothing to grab. Right? Yeah. Absolutely nothing, right? I reach over and grab that sergeant. He says, "Let go of me." <laughs> right? and so I'm holding like underneath, like this, like that. You know, so pushing back against the air, trying yeah. try not to pass out because I figured if I passed out, I was going to fall out of the aircraft, right? And, uh, and I remember flying. We were flying at like three thousand feet. It took like twenty minutes. Fly through a rainstorm, right? It was endless, right? The whole time I'm going. Every time we bank, I'm going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so we land. I'm like, oh, thank God. And you're probably in shock in at this point. Oh, yeah. Very shocking. Right. We land in Tainan. I go, oh, thank God. I don't see anybody. They take all the Vietnamese off, and we take off again. They never even come to look at us, right? And I go, oh, no. <laughs> so we take off. We get about 500 feet, fly for a couple of minutes, and land again. Yeah. Right? The American hospital this time. Yeah. Right? And, uh, and get out of the helicopter. I didn't want to see another helicopter in my life. <laughs> they walk us down to the, to the triage, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, lying there. And they cut my uniform off, which really angered me because it was uh, tailored. Brand new, tailored. Well, it wasn't brand new, but yeah. it was definitely tailored. Tailored cam uniform. Cam cam yeah. cam no, don't do that. Right. Anyway, so they cut it off. Right. And there's, you know, I think there's a half a dozen people in this room. Right. Even before I got there. Right. And the next thing I know, they're wheeling me into the operating room. And I, and I said to them, "Aren't you, is this triage? Aren't you supposed to take the most wounded first? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and he goes, man. They really didn't care about your boat. No, they didn't. Yeah. All right, so they, they put me on the table, put a mask on, right? And they say, all right, count, de count backwards from 10. Now they go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. And I'm thinking, am I, when I get to 1, should I go to 0 and go negative? Or should I go like 0. 0.999, 0. 0.998, right? And yeah. they turn the gas on. Oh. <laughs> all right, and I'm out. I never got to two. I never got past seven. I didn't get to two. They I think turned they, me. They turned my gas on quick. Or yeah, I think they, they I think they were playing with me. Yeah, they might right. have been. Anyway, so they came. We so when I came out there, of it in the post op room, and this it was like these Quonset huts that were held up by air conditioning. Yeah. Right. Rubber rooms. Like, yeah. They're shaking me like crazy. There's a reason they put us in rubber rooms. Yeah. You realize that. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Anyway, and uh, you know, I I noticed this later on, but uh, but the uh, you know they. As you're recovering, they try to get the gas out of you. So they, if you could, if you're ambulatory, they'd make you walk. So I had to yeah. walk, pushing my IV, walk all the way back to the, to yeah. the helipad, and then back again, which is probably 100 feet. Yeah. And uh, but I was noting where the bunkers were, because uh, Tainin was known as Rocket City, and I was going to go for a bunker if they started shooting, right? And uh, anyway, and then I they put me back in the bed, and I'm I'm looking at the TV, and there's this. A uh, show that was on like at night, you know, I don't remember what it was. And I remember thinking, wow, they show that during the day. And then I realized, then I look at the clock, it's like 7.30. Yeah. Right? And I have no idea how that, how that much time mm -hmm. passed. Because right? that was the next time I, I actually knew what was going on. Anyway, so then next day they flew us on a C-123 down to, to uh, Tonsonut to yeah. Third Field Hospital. And put me in Third Field Hospital. It's old... Were you French. able to move your arm at this point? No. No? No, I couldn't. And it was all bandaged. I never mm -hmm. did. I couldn't see the, the wound, right? So it was bandaged from here to here. Mm -hmm. and, and I couldn't move my fingers at all. And, uh, 
So they put me in Third Field Hospital. It was old French hospital. It was a huge, thick, no air conditioning, huge, thick walls, mm-hmm. right? And uh, then, you know, so I'm sort of sitting there on top of the, the bed, being very uncomfortable. And the, uh, this captain comes in, and he's, he's reading the names at the end of the bed. And he goes, then, get up and stand at the end of your bed. He gets to me, get up, stand at the end of your bed. What's going on? Right? The next thing I know, he comes back to this uh, lieutenant colonel, handing out purple hearts, yeah. right? which I actually found insulting. I just didn't think that was, was the proper way to do that. You know, they stuck one on, well. Yeah, right. I mean, we're not here about me. Yeah, yeah right. They stick them on your, your yeah. hospital gown, and right. half the time you don't even know they're in the room, or right. you don't yeah. remember it until later. Right, well, this I, I was mm-hmm. sentient, so. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, the, uh, so then they, after I'd been there two days, they said, all right, you're going to, to, thir- to uh, Camp Zama, Army Hospital in uh-huh. Japan, and mm-hmm. then back to the States. Was uh, that in Osaka, or was that in, in uh, Kyoto? No, it's, it was near uh, Tokyo. Near Tokyo. Yeah, 30 okay. minutes outside of Tokyo yeah. by train. Mm-hmm. Right, and so uh, they trucked us over t- after like three or four days. Mm-hmm. And at that point, I figured, well, I'm going to have to tell my parents. So left-handed, I wrote like a one line. I'm wounded, but I'm okay, you know, and mailed it. Right, and... Uh, so I uh, get transferred over to the to the Air Force transient hospital. Uh-huh. Right, spend the night. And of course, they're trying to, all along. They're trying to charge me for food, right? But I have no money. Charge you for food? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it's the army. Officer, you pay for your meals, right? But I don't have any money, so they, you know, military <laughs> pay currency or anything else. Yeah. You know, uh-huh. we were in the field. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't. All my stuff was in a Connex container. <laughs> yeah. And uh, anyway, so then we fly to to Japan. And we spend the night in, a, in an Air Force hospital at the wherever that air base was, right? Charging me for food that I can't pay, right? And then the next day, with one helicopter, I think they all day long they flew us from from the air base to the to the uh, hospital, right? And I was in the last flight, so I was sitting there all day long waiting for this to happen, and uh, and it was very cloudy that day, right? And it was when I it was the first time I ever realized that Japan was really mountainous. Mm-hmm. Right, it was really cool. Anyway, so we landed at Zama, and I'm like the last person they see. It's now they started this at like nine o'clock in the morning. It's now like six o'clock at night, right? And finally, they call me. And this major he takes the bandages off. It's the first they wouldn't take them off. They'd been on for like five days. They would not take them off after they put them on. And I couldn't get far enough away. They were starting to smell, uh-huh. right? So he takes them off, and they're all stuck on there. So he has to pull them off, which really hurt. And then I said to him. This big mistake. I said, I want to see it. Right? So he goes and gets a mirror. It holds it underneath. And I can see about that much of the bone. Right? This is open right to the bone. And uh, I went, all right, that's, that's yeah. enough of that. I don't this need to see that. Just be careful what you ask for. Yeah, right. Yeah. I'm not doing that again. Right? Mm-hmm. And then he says, he directs me to, the, to where to go. And it was an all officers ward. Junior officers. Yeah. Right? And warrant officers. But mostly, you know, like second and first lieutenants, mm-hmm. right? And so I walked down there, and, and uh, the they had, the hospital was this old World War II, the end of World War II wooden hospital, and so they had these screened-in walkways, right? And then a nurses' station, and then you know two wards that go off on either side, and then it would continue to the next, and so they had different stuff in different locations. Anyway, so I go to where I'm supposed to go, and I'm standing in the in the nurses' station, and I look on the on the the wall. There's no nurse there. I'm waiting for somebody to show up. And there's uh, this grease pen- pencil board, right? Obviously the bed assignments because they're names, right? And one of them is Hunt, comma, J. And I went, nah, it couldn't be. I just saw him, right? But anyway, so th- when the nurse came, she was the first lieutenant too, right? She comes in and I said, what's Hunt's first name? And she goes, she looks at him and goes, Joseph. I went, nah, it couldn't be. She said, I'll go get him. And it was, right? He'd been had a broken leg from a hand yeah. grenade, uh-huh. right? So she gave me a bed right next to his, which was a bad idea. Yeah. We got in a lot of trouble. <laughs> anyway, after four or five days, he, right, or ten days, eight days, something like that, he got, he actually went back to Vietnam because he had a friend who was dealing with assignments, so he figured he could get back into his old yeah. slot. They told me if I went back, I would be unassigned. <clears throat> they did not want you going back. Yeah. They, they discouraged you. Anyway, so, uh, so I was there for almost 30 days, supposed to be their maximum 10 days. Yeah. After I'd been there for like three weeks, the same major I'd seen 
that first day comes through. He looks at me and goes, what are you doing here? I go, how do you work here? What do you Had tell they me? They closed up the wound at that point. Yeah, no, yeah, that first that I got there like a Tuesday, or Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, and then the the following Monday they they operated on it. So it'd been like ten days. After so you that. did go through another surgery. Yeah, so it was all it was it was sewn up. And in fact, they'd already taken the stitches out at this point. And uh, so he goes and checks, and he says, "All right, got some good news and some bad news." Like an hour later, he says, uh, "The good news is I know why you're still here. The bad news is I don't know if we can fix it." <laughs> <laughs> he said the uh, the doctor who uh, was in attendance when they sewed me up, they did it with a local, and uh, it was actually a Japanese resident who did all the work. He was just standing there talking to me, right, the whole time. He had been transferred to Vietnam. He never finished the post-operative report, and they wouldn't send me back to the States without the post-operative report. And he's gone, right? So it took them several days to figure out what to do, but eventually they decided they knew what to do. This is one of the famous right. snafus. Right. Now, I should mentioned that uh, right after I, they sewed me up, so I'm still high on Demerol, uh, I decided it's time to call my mother, right? Now, I have no idea what time it is. In the, I didn't know what time it was in Japan, I, much less what time it was in the States, <laughs> right? And I didn't know what I was doing. So I, I pick up the phone and, and uh, say, I want to make a collect call, right? And give, them the, give this woman the number. And, and, she, and I hear her say, the phone ring, and I hear, hear my mother answer, and I hear her say, Will you accept a collect call from blah blah in Japan? No names, right? And there's this pause, and my mother goes, "Okay." <laughs> you know, as she told me later, she, I, I, you have to understand that this is like three o'clock in the morning her time, and she just arrived back from her father's funeral, and she was expecting a phone call from my brother-in-law that my because my sister was supposed to have a baby at any time, right? And uh, so she goes, "Okay," right? I'm half asleep, and uh, and I go. Ma, and she goes, who's this? I go, who's John. Yeah. And she goes, John, John, why are you calling? <laughs> We're upon, I'm holding the phone like this. I almost slammed it back down. It was yeah. really close. Right? And I go, I got, you didn't get my letter? No. I, go, I got wounded, but I'm okay. I'm in Japan. And she goes, okay. I talked, apparently I talked to my father. I don't remember this, but she told me recently, I talked to my father. I have no memory of that. Yeah. The drugs. The Demerol. Yeah, I'll do it to you. Anyway, so I hang up. I figured, you know, fulfilled my, my obligations. That morning, she got the letter, right? So she never went back to sleep. She waited until, until 7 to go down to the Red Cross. It took them three weeks to find me. She was going yeah. crazy, right? Well, anyway, so eventually, it was like four weeks to the day, I finally leave, fly to, to uh, well, actually, they trucked us back to the Air Force Hospital because you got to spend the night in the Air Force Hospital. Right, and then flew to Anchorage, then from Anchorage to uh, to outside of Washington D.C. someplace. Oh, um, you then, mean the Air Force Base? Outside? Right, yeah, the Air Force Base, and so I spent the night in the Air Force Hospital. Yeah, there. Andrews, I think. Probably yeah, Andrews, I think you're right. Yeah. Andrews, yeah. Right, and then the next day, they hopscotch up the countryside because they send you to the hospital nearest your home. Mm -hmm. Right, in my case, that was Fort Davis, Massachusetts, because there were no bases in Connecticut. Right, and so I'm the last guy off the plane. Right, get to to uh, to Fort Devens, they you know they bust me over there, right? Put me in this ward. I'm all by myself. This is the middle of summer. It's really hot. It's a World War II building again, no air conditioning, conditioning. Yeah. right? And I'm sitting there, and this uh, sergeant first class comes in, and goes, "There's a broom in the corner. Sweep the floor." And he turns around, and walks out. And I go, and I get up, and I pick up the broom, and I go, "Wait a minute, what am I doing?" Yeah, exactly. <laughs> first you lieutenant, I don't do that. <laughs> yeah, I don't do that, right? The next morning he comes back and he goes, uh, sweep the floor, then mop the floor. And before he could say anything else, I said to him, don't you mean mop the floor, sir? And he looks at me and he goes, don't you backtalk me. And I said, don't you mean, don't you backtalk me, sir? And he goes, I'm going to go talk to the colonel. And I said, don't you mean I'm going to go talk to the colonel, sir? sir. <laughs> <laughs> and he's out the door, yeah. right? You know, it was one of these, what are they going to do? Send me to Nam? Yeah, right. exactly. And uh, a few minutes later, this spec four comes in, the company clerk right, type. And he goes, Colonel wants to see you. I don't care. I've gone halfway around the world in my pajamas. Are you I in pajamas? I was in pajamas. Yeah. I hadn't seen the uniform in, uh -huh. in a month, right? And so I pad down to the, follow him down to the, to the, the colonel's office. He's a lieutenant colonel. And, uh, and then stand in the inner door. His, the colonel's door. And I just, I just stand there. I don't say a word. The colonel's writing something, right? 
he looks up at me and says, before you say anything, let me apologize. Right? Oh, good. He said, you know he's wrong. I know he's wrong. Right? But I'm really shorthanded, and I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't cause any problems. And I said, sir, I'm not going to cause any problems, but I'm not going to accept that kind of treatment. He goes, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put you on convalescent leave for a month, <laughs> which was a good deal. Right? He said, but before we do that, you know, you've got like seven months left in the Army. Where do you want to, where do you want to go? And I said, well, I want to stay here for Devon's so I can go rock climbing. And all the places I grew up rock climbing. Right? Were you able to move your arm at this point? I could bend it. I, it. I had just been able to touch my face. Okay. Right? Had no strength in it. And he said, actually, four days later, I went rock climbing. Mm -hmm. I almost killed myself because I couldn't use my right arm. But anyway, that's another story. Um, and so I said, I want to stay here. He goes, uh, well, there's not much here. There's a service and support, I won't tell you what we called it, battalion. And, I know uh, what you called it. Yeah, <laughs> for, uh, short, for best short not timers. Say it, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> for short timers, he said, "No, I'm going to send you there." Uh, there's um, the Army Security Agency uh, School for NCOs, right? Military Intelligence School for NCOs. We're not going to send you there. He said, "The only other thing is 10th Special Forces Group." And I went, "Oh, I could do that." He goes, "Well, we'll see. I'll I'll, I'll find out." He said, "But uh, but what's your second choice?" And I said, "How about Fort Carson, Colorado? Go climbing there." And he said, all right, what's your third choice? And I said, how about Fort Lewis, Washington? Never climbed in the Pacific West, Northwest. Well, anyway, so I come back a month later, I have orders for 10th Group, right? And uh, I'm not Special Forces qualified, but I'm Airborne Ranger qualified. So. So, uh, so I go there, B Company, right? And they don't really have anything for me to do. I made a couple of maps for them and stuff for a party, <laughs> you know, that sort of stuff, right? And then they said, all right, we're going to send you advanced party to England with this captain. Uh, Pierce, I think his name was, uh, like five days early because you got to you know make sure the barracks are okay and stuff like that, and uh, and then you can go to Munich during Oktoberfest as an extra officer without a job, and I went, wow, my kind of army, right? <laughs> so I go to to England, five day drunk, right? We go to London, we we, we took five minutes to do what we had to do, and then we then we went into London every day. Right? I had to attend a briefing for the that the colonel got. The, the, the full colonel, who was the group commander, Colonel Green. Uh, but after that, we were free, right? So we went, we went into England every day, into London every day by train. This was just outside of, of uh, London, not too far. It was like 30 minutes by train. And uh, it was a, a World War II bomber base that's no longer there now. And anyway, so we, we do that. And then the, the, the rest of the unit, B Company, shows up, and, the, and I'm trying to sober up at this point. And the, uh, the, the, the major, who was the com company commander, goes, all right, mandatory officers call to the bar. And I go, no, I went to bed. Yeah, that was it. Right? But then I found out that uh, then the next morning I go to uh, the briefing, right? And, uh, and this captain starts by saying, we have a problem, to, to Colonel Green. We have a problem. The uh, uh, B Company showed up, and, and this Lieutenant Brew, B-R-U-G-H, I think it was spelled, but... Anyway, he broke his arm, I think falling off a bar stool the night before deployment. Anyway, he had a broken arm. So he was not going to be able to jump in to, to southern Bavaria in this operation. I have to replace him. And I'm going, oh, no, I'm <laughs> trying to hide. Yeah. And Colonel Green goes, I will replace him with Dowd. I didn't think he knew who I was, right? And, uh, and I kind of blurted out, but I'm not special forces qualified. And he goes, that's all right, you're ranger qualified. It's a ranger kind of operation. <laughs> so I wasn't getting out of that. <laughs> anyway, so I ended up going to isolation, getting briefed. And, and I'm the, the uh, XO of this A-team. I didn't know any of these people. I jumped into southern Bavaria in the middle of the night, landed between a, an electric fence and a barbed wire fence. Where, what area of southern Bavaria? Uh, it was, was it Garmisch? Or? Yeah, it was, it was south of Munich, about 30, 40 miles. Uh, that, that would probably be yeah. in the Oberammergau Garmisch. Yeah, area I'm not sure exactly where it was. They, yeah. uh, Kaufbüren was the nearest town because mm -hmm. uh, we rented an Opel Cadet. So you did an airdrop in there? Yeah, we jumped in. You jumped in? Yeah, middle of the night. Uh, they, they flew the primary drop zone. Our primary drop zone, the pots weren't lit. Uh, then they flew, the, the other team was the Halo team. So they flew the Halo team primary drop zone and they went out the back. And then they flew our secondary and the pots were lit, six pots. So I'm the, one of the, I'm the 
the assistant jump master. So I'm, I'm the last guy out on the, on the uh, left side of the aircraft, right? I go out, clear my chute, look around. I can hear cowbells, right? Can't, it was so dark. It was, it was a, cloudless, a cloudy night, so there was no lights at all. The pots are already gone. Right? I never saw him once I went out the plane. Right? I could, the plane's gone. He's not flying any lights either. And, and so it was just by sound I figured he was in this direction. And it was a little darker here and a little darker here. And as I got lower down, I could see a, a gray thing that I thought was a building. Right? And uh, so I sort of steered away from stuff that as best I could and, and, and ended up landing this far from the post on the barbed wire fence. Did a parachute landing far about that far over into the barbed wire fence. And then when I reached to, to grab my pack, you know, it was on a lowering line, right? I hit the electric fence. I actually landed between them. Hit it again before I figured out exactly where it was. It was much later, one of the other guys told me how to handle the barbed wire, the electric fence. You use your M16 to push down on it because the nylon doesn't conduct electricity. Yeah, but, I, yeah. you know, I didn't think of that, you know, dumb. Anyway, so I eventually get all my stuff over the barbed wire fence and I start walking back the, I hope, the direction that that the plane had come from. And inside of five minutes, all 13 of us, the 12 guys, A-team and the, and the, and the grader, right, find each other, no sound. It was unbelievable. And we march off. Lucky. Yeah. We spent two weeks running around the, the woods being chased by the German Border Patrol. <laughs> they, never, they, didn't, they couldn't find us. We, and very early on, we, they rented, two, uh, two of the sergeants were, had uh, German wives, they'd been with uh, at Van Tolles, and spoke passable German. So they, and they carried civilian clothes, which we weren't supposed to have. And so they, they hitched a ride to Coffee and rented an Opal Cadet. And that's how we got around the countryside. Oh. <laughs> and we never told anybody where we really were. We always gave them phony coordinates. So did you s stay with the 10th for the balance of your Army career? Yes. Yep. And uh, where, what was your base camp? We were at Devons, Fort Devons, okay. Massachusetts. No, I mean, I, oh, I, miss, I misstated. Yeah. Where were you? What, what was your physical concern in Germany? What? When we were there? We yeah, just, where? Yeah, well, it was just, we were just running around the woods. Oh, okay. So right. you, we, the whole time you were there. We were, we, the whole time I was there, we, um, it was two weeks, right? We never got resupplied, so we had to buy, you know, acquire mm -hmm. stuff. We rented the upstairs of a guest house, right, and sent a couple guys in every night and we'd get a meal. And the, and the, uh, the owner and his wife and daughter were in on it. Right? They they knew what was going on, and they lied every time the German border patrol looking around, looking for us came. <laughs> they eventually found us the last day, because uh, they spotted the the uh, the Opal Cadet, which they had previously discovered was being used illicitly. Mm -hmm. right? So we got captured the last morning, which saved us a long walk, because we uh, we got trucked back to Munich, to the headquarters. Okay, right. so for those who are listening that don't quite understand yeah. how all that happened, it was basically a field training exercise it was for the 10th huge, Special Forces. It was, well, for, for NATO. It was, for it, NATO. Yeah, it was, uh, oh, they had a name for it. But they, they ran this every year, every year, in those days, Reforger or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was Air Force, the Navy, and, and various uh, American units, including mm -hmm. 10th Group, plus the... Uh, uh, units from various countries. I see. Right, and lots of different countries. So uh, that was your, what we used to call your terminal tour in the Army. Well, yeah. No but, pun intended. Yeah, well actually, yeah. It was, but, so I get back, actually we got extracted on a, on a Blackbird, mm -hmm. right, uh, which was all blocked off so you couldn't see all the electronic gear. And he came in, we got trucked to the, to the German Air Force Base, right, and they had pots, the three pots, the two at the end, one pair a third of the way down. We're standing, I'm standing on the right-hand side and the other half of the team's on the left-hand side. And uh, I was the last person on the right-hand side. All right, C-141, uh, C-130 comes in, no lights. There are no lights. They turned all the lights off in the airport, all right? He comes in, he turns his landing lights on when he's like 200 feet in the, in the air, touches down exactly where we are, goes down the runway, you know, slams on his brakes, reverse, the props, everything, flips it around, comes roaring back down the runway, flips it around, comes by us. The uh, tailgate is down, you know, like six inches off the, off the runway. And we run up the tailgate, right? Except that uh, as soon as I hit the tailgate as the last guy, they firewalled it. 
right? Yeah. And so we were actually taking off while I'm grabbing the, the chairs. And I'm looking over my shoulder, we're like 200 feet in the air. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tailgate's still open. <laughs> my buddies are pulling me in, you know. It was, I didn't think you could get away with that. Yeah. But uh, it was, a, cause it was, they were practicing a tactical extraction, basically. Right. right, so it was, you know, but anyway, so we get back and, and uh, the powers to be at, at 10th group go, look, if uh, you go voluntary indefinite, right, extend for at least another year, uh -huh. right, we will uh, give you an A team, send you to Special Forces Officers course, right? At this point, are you in 1971? Uh, this is, well, this was in fall of 1970, and so it was, okay. right, it was late 1970 when they did this. Okay. Right? And, uh, and I go, all right, sounds good. I like this. I'm mm -hmm. having fun. Right? And so, uh, so, I, so I spent, before I went to Special Forces Officers course, I spent 12 weeks learning Greek. Right? That I was, was going to ask you about that. Yeah, said, right. Yeah, you have Greek jump wings? Greek jump wings. Yeah, we jumped, jumped to the Greek jump school. Right? Wow. So, so, uh, so my A team was oriented toward Greece, so the whole team learned Greek. Right? And then... Uh, went to Special Forces Officer Course, and, and there were two Greek officers there. So immediately, I, you know, yeah, Kelly Mary, he kind of thing. And uh, and the, and so they, but they always wanted to practice English. So I didn't practice as much Greek as I would have liked. But anyway, eventually, that next fall, next time exercise, I was actually the S four for the B team. We went and went to Greece to support the A teams that were in Greece. So you were responsible as a supply officer then, right. even the S four. Right. Okay. Which, which in special forces is actually, you know, see, so we had to take care of all sorts of, of uh, gear and stuff and move it here and there, and all sorts of stuff. You're the ammo guy too, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I had everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So when were you? So you went to Fort Bragg to do your special forces. I did. Forces went training? to Fort Bragg for special forces, and then came okay. back, got, got my flash. And when back. were you actually discharged from active duty? All right, and then that next fall, mm -hmm. all right, it was less than a year. Right, October, November, something like that. I got a, a, a form from the Department of the Army said, uh, at, at that point they were actually doing, uh, uh, you know, getting rid of people. A riff. There was a riff, mm -hmm. right? And they riffed some people in Special Forces who'd been there like 16, 17 years. It was, you know, captains. And, and I went, hmm, that's not good. And uh, so I get this form from the Department of the Army said, if you want to get out of the Army, sign this form, send it directly back to the Department of the Army, uh, we don't care how much time you have left. You do not need to talk to anybody. You don't have to inform your commander. You can just, just send it back to us. And I was mad at somebody for something or other, you know, typical army. I went, ah, it looks good to me. So I signed it, sent it back, and made arrangements to go back to school. By this point, you were a captain. I was a captain. Okay. Right. Um, so back to school, meaning back to college. Back to the University of Maine, yeah, to finish okay. up. And... Um, so when were you actually discharged? From so I was discharged in early February 1972. So you had basically four years. Yeah, basically four years. All right. And then, and then, so I get out of the Army on a Tuesday, drive up to the University of Maine, get there like 11 o'clock at night. Eight o'clock the next morning, I'm sitting in class. I'd already arranged a, you know, class and stuff. And uh, I remember waiting for two hours for the mess hall to open, as I thought of it, right? And uh, anyway, so I sit in the front of the class, it's a big lecture theater, get the end of the first class, start to walk out, and the professor, who was one of the people I talked to about going back to school, calls me over and said, this isn't going to work if you cut class. This was a Wednesday. I said, Dr. Griffin, I was still in the Army on Monday. I didn't get out of the Army until yesterday yeah, afternoon. Yeah. And he goes, well, don't let it happen again, which I think he probably meant don't cut any more classes, but right. I took to be, don't go back to the Army. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, then I stayed in school forever. So you stayed in school forever and became a professor. Right. Yeah. I went. I finished there and then went to graduate school. And, and what did you study in graduate school? Well, mostly hydrology. Okay. It was and actually in the forestry school at Yale. But where did, at Yale? At Yale. Yeah. And so it, I have a master's and PhD from Yale. I see. Okay. In hydrology. Yes. Which is all about water movement. All about water movement. Yes. Okay. Um, I would, I'd like to ask you, if you don't mind, sure. to, um, I'd like to ask you a few sort of background post-Army questions. First mm -hmm. of all, did you stay in the reserves or not? I, I, well, I, I got in the reserves by uh, first. It was really hard to get in the reserves in those days. They were f essentially full. And, uh, you know, people still avoiding Vietnam. And the, uh, 
And this is not when I was at Maine, but when I went, went back to New Haven. Because I grew up just outside New Haven, so I was familiar with that area. Mm -hmm. had friends in that area. And I, I, went, I started taking the advanced course, which was essentially for free. Right. My point is they didn't pay me to do that. But I started doing that uh, just to sort of keep my hand in, because I was in the inactive reserve, so I had four years active duty. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then uh, a friend of mine told me about uh, a unit he was in, a civil affairs unit in Danbury. Right? And, uh, and so I joined them. And so I show up the first day wearing the only uniform I have, which was a green beret, blouse boots. Right? They weren't impressed. <laughs> stud, stud uniform. Yeah. I became the, the, uh, the, the weapons officer, among other things, for the Civil Affairs Unit. Anytime they had infantry questions, I got to do it. <laughs> okay. Um, how were you generally, by, I, I know you went back to a college environment. Mm -hmm. And we sort of all know what the college environment was like yes. in 72 as far as for Vietnam veterans. Right. But I don't want to color your answer here with, with right. whatever I think. How were you received by your family and friends? Um, well, my as, family, actually my family, was, it was interesting because, you know, I, to, I told you my father said don't volunteer for anything. Right? And when I told him, when I, I, I didn't actually say, I'll tell you this, really. when, when I called him up, when I found out I was going to infantry OCS, I called up my father and, you know, my parents. And of course, New Jersey used to have a phone strike, so it took forever to get through. And my father answers, and I go, Dad, guess what? I'm going to infantry OCS. And his response was, and I quote, you idiot. If you were going to do that, why didn't you join the Navy? <laughs> but my mother told me recently that, that um, this is while I was in Vietnam. She, she was a school teacher in um, sixth grade. And she would go in the, in the teacher's room, and they'd be bad mouthing the military and you know in Vietnam and all. She said more than once she just had to walk out. She was so irritated with them. So they they were a lot more sympathetic, although they weren't they were not particularly sympathetic about me staying in the military. What about the general reception you had from the population other than your family? Yeah, well, for the most part, people didn't know I was in the military, right? Uh, it was an interesting experience when I went a very mixed experience when I went back to school. Uh, some people knew, I, I mean, people who I was in class with, some of them knew I'd been in the military. It wasn't too obvious. I had Did a, they know you'd been in Vietnam? Uh, well, yeah, I, missed, the, I used to wear, for a long time, I would only wear long sleeve shirts because the back of my arm was really ugly looking mm -hmm. and really obvious. But uh, yeah, some of them did. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I, I took that first semester I went back to school, one of the required courses was a history course, which I'd been putting off forever, of course, because it wasn't interesting. So I took, I took uh, uh, Civil War, I mean, 1865 to the present, his American history, right? And, at the, and it was a, a large lecture and then a breakout recitation once a week with about 20 people in it, some graduate student, long hair hippie type teaching it. And most people wouldn't say anything in class, and I was rather uninhibited when it came to stuff like that, since I was probably his age anyway. And uh, anyway, they had to write a paper at the end of the the class, and so I wrote a paper on uh, about the Vietnamese Rangers and Vietnam, right? And basically, a bunch of my experiences, you know, and, and but it was from a, the perspective of how well they would do, how well tra they trained where they were, and all that sort of stuff. Because they were an elite unit, and uh, I get this paper back, right? And it got and it said the only thing it said on it there was not a mark on it, and it said an interesting perspective. I disagree. B plus. Could have killed the guy. But, uh, you anyway. should have. Yeah. Uh, pardon, pardon my editorial comment. Yeah. Um, I got an A in the class anyway. <laughs> good. Um, were you? Did you feel that the reaction uh, that you got from the the country was uh, friendly to you, receptive to you, or or did you feel it was negative? Oh, you? it was definitely negative. In fact, for the most part, you just you didn't talk about it because of that. Uh, and uh, I felt I feel so strongly about it now that that. Uh, a year ago at, at Georgia, the University of Georgia, where I teach, they, uh, they started something called the Student Veterans Resource Center, right, to help the veterans at the University of Georgia. And, uh, and I became the, uh, the faculty advisor for Franklin College, the biggest unit, right, and, uh, and work with them. In fact, next month I'm giving a, a talk to the, to the new veterans who are, who are starting at Georgia about how to interact with the faculty. And it's basically based upon my experiences uh, and all the wrong things I did when I went, because I, you know, 
basically, you know, I was a captain of special forces. What do I need to talk to these people for? Right. You know? Well, we were kids. Yeah, right. So you have to Wise put it ass. in perspective. Yes. But it's now 40 plus years post Vietnam. Mm -hmm. What are your, looking back, um, are you proud of your service? Are you well, yeah. Yes, embarrassed I about it? You no, happy? no, proud of it. Uh, I was always irritated at what happened to Vietnam. You know, remember, I worked with the Vietnamese. I don't work with Americans. I worked with the Vietnamese. To some, and it became fairly close to some of them. And, and I always thought it was horrible what we did to them or what we didn't do for them. I would just abandon them. And uh, that was, and it was really unfortunate. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the Nixon, the Paris Peace Accord, uh, Nixon represented to the Vietnamese that he would provide right. not only supply parts, but aerial support. Right, exactly. And, and after he resigned, uh, Congress, the, you know, the, right. it doesn't make a yep. difference what the party was. Right. They, Congress, uh, in fact, reversed the Paris Peace Accords and right. said, no, we won't. And right. And that was, was right it. after yeah. that when it failed. Yep. Um, do you see any similarities in between what went on in, in 73 to 75 and what's going on now in Afghanistan and Iraq? Frighteningly so. I mean, it, it's, it's so similar that it's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, they, they, you can't pull the plug like that and, and expect good things to happen. Yeah. You know, it's um, really frightening. I think is, if there's anything else at all you want to tell us either about your specific mm -hmm a specific contact or a specific thing about Vietnam or just your retrospective uh, on it now? No, I, don't, I mean, I think I pretty much covered it. I mean, there were, there were lots, there were a million anecdotes. I mean, I, I can think of lots of you know, experiences here and there that, that I had. Uh, most, for the most part, I said this when I was in the reserves uh, one Memorial Day or something, they invited several of us to to talk on the, this local television station in Danbury, right? And uh, so I show up in my uniform, you know, CIB, Vietnamese Ranger badge, all that stuff, right? And uh, as the, the local color right? oh. <laughs> with, the, uh, with the colonel who was the commander of this unit, civil affairs unit, they're mostly doctors and lawyers and stuff like that. Right. And, uh, and the interview, interviewer asked me uh, how I liked Vietnam. And I went, well, I really enjoyed it, <laughs> you know, but you know, and which was true. There were lots of things about Vietnam that were fascinating, and and you know, interesting. I didn't particularly like getting blown up. I didn't particularly like getting shot at. I didn't particularly like working in areas where you had to be careful about you know tripping a booby trap or something. But that was part of the job, you know. It was the best of times and the yeah, worst. And of the worst, times. exactly. And right. and you know, uh, I was, you know. Despite how I got in the army, I always had mixed feelings about that. Uh, I considered myself a professional soldier, and you know, and I was doing a job, and that's the way I treated it. Well, I want to thank you for your service. Mm -hmm. um, I want to welcome you home <laughs> thank as you. a brother infantryman myself, <laughs> and I want to thank you for being willing to do this interview today. It takes a lot of, a lot of guts, and there's a lot of memories involved. I'm right. sure. But uh, we very much appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You want me to hold the DD two fourteen? Yeah. So explain. Okay. All right. This All right. is what we'll see, John. So we'll okay. Explain. All right. So this was the Vietnamese Ranger beret. All right. It was uh, maroon in color, and this was the the Vietnamese badge. One of the two badges that the Vietnamese had, and this is the Vietnamese rank. We always wore both Vietnamese and American rank, right? And so I wore. This is uh, the, the two lotus flowers, our, our first lieutenant, right? One is a second lieutenant, three are the captain. And, uh, or Dai Wee. This is uh, Trung Wee. Trung Wee. Yeah. And, uh, and then also wore the, the, the rank here on the uniform, right? So if it didn't have, because, you know, in the field, I didn't wear a beret. I wore, I wore a, not a steel pot. I only carried a steel pot once in the field. And that was because I wanted some place to sit down on when you're in the swamp. Lucky you. <laughs> no, I, you know, because there was nobody watching us, right? Yeah. So I wore, I had a, a flop hat that with a really wide brim. They were trying to get me to cut down, but I could pull it down over my glasses and keep my glasses dry. So yeah, the right. good thing about a steel pot is you could sh put water in it and shave out of it. Uh, that's you true. could cook your food in it. No, in fact, in fact, we've been, we've been in Cambodia maybe two weeks, uh -huh. 10 days, right? And I hadn't shaved, right? And nobody actually said anything. But at one point it was getting so itchy that I, I had to shave, right? And so I got, I, I got some water, but I didn't even have a way to heat it up. So I got some water in my steel pot, 
right, because I had it with me. I never wore it, right? And, and I was sitting in the right-hand seat of the Jeep seat with the, the Jeep mirror, right, shaving. And I look up, and there's this, I think it was Japanese, photographer taking pictures of me, right? Because there was a bunch of photojournalists who were, were there because the day before there had been a big firefight or something. And, uh, and I looked at him, and I just glared at him. Right? I didn't want my picture taken. He walks away. <laughs> I've often wondered how many pictures he took before I noticed he was doing that. This is not my idea of a good time. And you have your green beret here. Yeah, also, I have my don't green you? beret. Yeah. Right. So this is this is the, the solid green flash is the is the the uh, says it's tenth group, tenth special forces group, which was the original special forces group, the one in Bad Tolls, right? And then Captain's Bars, right? I have. Just for fun, my notebook from Vietnam. Really? Yeah. Here, take a look. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. My. Uh, wow. Right. This is the the Vietnamese Ranger badge. Right. Uh, which you wore over your right breast. Right. And it's it's actually it was given to me by Don Valentine when I first joined the unit. Right. There were only like 3,500 uh, Vietnamese Ranger advisors in the entire war. And uh, it's actually inscribed on the back with my name, right, that he had done. And uh, this was the, we wore, without the Viet Dung Quan on the top, we wore this patch, right, on mm -hmm. the, uh, the right-hand side. The MACV patch on the left-hand side. Oops. So now if you were in your uniform, you would wear your MACV patch on the right sleeve. Yeah, now it's the MACV yeah. patch on the right. Right, and then, okay, keep going. Sure, and then above that was this scroll. So it was it was worn like this, with that scroll. It said uh, Vietnamese Ranger. Right. So it was it was worn like that on the on the right. On yeah, the, I think it's a much shoulder. better Ranger patch than ours. Oh yeah, much better. Yeah. Yeah, much much nicer. So then this was the. The Mac V patch wore on the on the other side, right? And then this is maybe most second most proud of this after the Ranger badge was the uh, this is my father's CIB. It is CIB in and of itself. Is yes, to be yes, proud. from World War Two. It's got the, the the separate musket rather than all cast as one. Oh, does it? Yeah, which is the way they did it in World War Two. Huh. Right. Which uh, somewhat unusual, right? And you guys can look, right? Right. These are the Greek jump wings, which I I never ever wore once, right? And because you can only wear one foreign badge, and you know it goes on the right hand side, and I always wore the Vietnamese Ranger badge. I have a set of Israeli jump wings. Wow. Yeah. I've also got a cap with the. Hebrew lettering above it and the big jump wings. On the really? Yeah, wow. Great looking cap. Then my, right, so that was the brass I wore with the, the 82nd 325, mm -hmm. right? And you guys can laugh at this one, right, in here. Right? I didn't mention this on, because it's too embarrassing, right? The, uh, our age, nothing should be embarrassing. Right, this is hey, a... You're on camera, do you want me to... No, that's all right, all right. right. So this is a slide, right? You can look at it, all right? This is from basic training. The day I graduated from basic training, all right? Ah, that skinny little guy there. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, can you replace that? Slide? Yeah, right. Yeah. And I was uh, sure. My father took that picture, right? Oh, I was the I was the uh, PT honor graduate from the from the company, right? Because I maxed the PT test. I got a 500, and. Uh, and so I got so I got the statue, right? And you know we were standing in front for the for the formation, right? But uh, before the just before the PT test, the, uh, the platoon sergeant said, All right, "Anybody who maxes the PT test, I will personally drive from the field back to the uh, headquarters and sign you out on a three-day pass. Fact, drive you back in my POV, right? Because they had this huge board at the entrance of the, the PT field, right? That had the names of everybody who had ever gotten a 500, which wasn't that many, right? And the platoon sergeant's name. 
and his buddy was on there and he wasn't, right? And he was dying to be on that, right? And he was good to his word. So I got a fi- I scored a 500, it wasn't that hard, right? Because it was before they had the grenade throw. It was a, right. the man carry. I could do that, no problem. The, uh, the one, and you know, I ran the, the mile in like 545 or something, it wasn't that hard. And the, uh, but anyway, the, and the, the ladders was, I could do that in you know, like six or seven seconds under the, the, t- the, the uh, minimum time. You know, helps, to be a rock, helps to be a rock climber. Yeah. Well, actually, I was, I was also a pole vaulter. Oh, you were? Yeah, I, actually, I, I held the, uh, my high school record for 27 years. Oh. Yeah, but uh, anyway, the... Uh, well, you were a jock. Yeah, I was a jock. I, didn't, I never studied. I was just yeah. fooling around. Well, but you it, did so much drinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, so, uh, yeah. so when, when, the, uh, when, I, when I scored the 500, he was, exci- he was excited. He actually drove me back and gave me, signed me out on a three-day pass. It was, uh, it was really hilarious. But anyway, so, uh, so I was one of the, the three people or five people out in front of the formation at, you know, at graduation. So it was really sure. bizarre. Yeah. Right. And the last. Right. Right. Uh, I actually have it on my computer. Maybe I should email it to you. I have the, the, uh, the picture. The offic- I scanned the official picture of when I was promoted to captain in Special oh. Forces. Right, you guys. You have all, your green uniform. Your green uniform on, you know, with all the stuff, green beret. You should, shouldn't have to we'll say. chat off camera. We'll chat. Yeah. Uh, anyway, okay. So, uh, some years ago, when I was cruising through a bookstore before going to England, I had research projects in England for years. Right, I stumbled across this book, Rangers at War. Right, Lerps in Vietnam. I go, oh, Rangers, Vietnam. I got to look at this. Right, and so I, I sort of looked through it. Right, and then the last chapter was on Ranger Advisors. And I went, oh, that's kind of cool, All right? And so, and then I quickly discovered, it's a long chapter, I quickly just, I'm standing in the bookstore, I quickly discovered that uh, it's sort of chronological, right? And I go, oh, that's even better. And then I found this section, it's like a page and a half, right? Uh, during the Cambodian incursion on Tong Tong 42, and Ranger Task Force 333. Now, Ranger Task Force 333 was the third Ranger group and then the, the Vietnamese cavalry. Right, so we were part of that. Right, and then it gets down to the end and, you know, it was talking about how successful it was and, you know, by Sve Riang and all that sort of stuff. Right, and, it, and then it says, the American losses in Thanh Thang 42 were limited to the wounding of the assistant senior advisor to the 52nd Arvin Ranger Battalion on 17 May, that which, answer, <laughs> which answers yeah. the question of when I got wounded, and the normal rotation of the same team staff sergeant weapons NCO who departed Vietnam 15 May. That's actually not correct because, as I told you, that the senior NCO was, was Joukowsky, Ski, and I talked to him on the radio on 17 May, so it was actually later than that, when he, but he was, he was ready to get out. In fact, I did his... Before we went to, to uh, Cambodia, I, I did his uh, his resume, right, and stuff. But I, I, so I had to. about you finding the book. With yeah. Your history. In there. Right. So I had to I had to buy it. So I started laughing in the bookstore. You know, people looking at me like I'm crazy. Yeah. Right. And so I, I just had to buy it. I mean, That's how can you not buy it? <laughs> yeah, it would have been better if they had my name, but you know. Really? But but there were clearly there's only one person who was the assistant senior advisor of the 52nd Vietnamese <laughs> Ranger Battalion in Cambodia. So. Yeah, it was pretty funny. But anyway. Well, thank you. Are we done? Yeah. yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. Hope I didn't 